All right, we're ready for our next panel, our next presentation. We by Professor James Boyle from Duke University School of Law right here. And I will turn the podium <laughs> on to Professor Boyle. Thank you very much. Um, Jennifer thanked a number of people um, in her introduction for putting this conference together. She did not, however, thank the person who has actually done the majority of the work for this conference, who is one Jennifer Jenkins. So I'd like you to start by thanking you. Uh, and to have as a colleague someone who is both uh, such a, an intellectual uh, confidant, someone who has uh, taught me a great deal uh, about things ranging from European copyright law to the DMCA's anti-circumvention provisions to uh, the way that artists uh, think uh, is just a delight. Uh, and to have someone who also is as anally retentive about running conferences at the same time as I am uh, makes it uh, a particular uh, pleasure. Um, this is really an honor and a pleasure to, to be here to talk about uh, David and Jeff's book. And um, I actually suffered um, considerable stage fright as I thought about getting ready for this presentation because while I feel quite competent to talk about what David and Jeff say, um, I wasn't sure how I should say it because both David and Jeff are marked by an extraordinary elegance um, of voice and an extraordinarily personal tone in the way that they write and the way that they speak. Um, to be sure, their, their styles differ, and that's one of the things that makes reading this book so fascinating. I can guess at who wrote particular lines in particular sections. Uh, Jeff has this sort of cultured, gentlemanly, thoughtful tone, which is so genteel that you miss the barb. Uh, which slides unnoticed into you and has left many a colleague at a faculty meeting or a, a, a competing scholar sort of lying on the floor wondering why his head was before him because he never felt the cut. Um, so there's a, certain, there's a certain beautiful and genteel but also, uh, but also dry, uh, dryly humorous quality to Jeff's uh, prose. And David, David's tone is simply non pare. David, David has this sort of sonorous and orbicular way of presenting things that sounds as though... He's, he's delivering granite-ready copy um, that, that when someone could actually be there with the chisel, just taking the, the stuff down verbatim. But yet, the content um, is very different than the tone. A uh, peculiar mixture of, of Jerry Garcia and Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Um, references to popular culture are ubiquitous, um, frequently to the movie Shane. Um, Tristram Shandy uh, length asides. In truth, sometimes one doesn't know what the actual subject matter of the in initial uh, conversation is. So fascinated is one by the aside to the asides. And David has never been afraid to be shocking. Um, I actually asked David uh, many years ago, he's probably forgotten, to, to write a paper for a conference I put on at Yale. Uh, and he, he wrote a paper called um, Cyberspace and Its Discontents, The Future of an Illusion. Um, and naturally, since we were talking about cyberspace in the First Amendment, David decided to write a uh, play about Freud uh, um, uh, and Hamlet. Um, uh, a natural approach, I think you'll agree. And um, he quickly discarded many of the normal conventions of scholarly discourse. And when I received his manuscript, I opened it up, sort of flipped through the first page and read this. Interior night, the castle. Lady Macbeth is in her bath in evident ecstasy. She may be tripping or masturbating or both. <laughs> this is not someone who simply writes about the First Amendment. This is someone who needs it. <laughs> So if I were able to do my job properly, um, I would be able to talk about this book in a style that showed just as much freedom, just as much playfulness, just as much lightheartedness and willingness to laugh uh, at myself as the authors consistently have displayed. Um, that I cannot accomplish, I decided, um, but I will at least give you in uh, the conclusion the few fragments that, I, uh, that my, my frenzied attempts managed to, to put forward. And I, I'll attempt to do the conclusion in the style of David Lang. I'd like to make four substantive points about David's book. Let's be very clear about what for me is the most exciting and most challenging portion of the book. David and Jeff, in the style of Justice Black, say that we should take an absolutist approach to the First Amendment and that that approach would bar almost every attempt by copyright law to enjoin the publication or copying 
of copyrighted material by someone else. You can always or almost always, in David and Jeff's uh, proposal, take. However, uh, they find no constitutional objection to a requirement that you also have to pay in certain circumstances. The key objection here is to the to the injunction, to the demand for permission, not necessarily to a demand for payment for any uh, resulting commercial benefit. And this is not where our current law is. It goes beyond what uh, Professor Netnell uh, put forward, which is, in my view, Neil's book is, is, is many things more than this. But one of the most useful things that it presents is, what would copyright law look like if we actually took our current First Amendment law seriously? And we don't, <laughs> at least in the copyright context. And Neil's book does a lot more than that. But in just doing, doing that, I think he's provided an incredibly valuable service. David and Jeff go further than that in a lot of ways to say, let's rethink it more fundamentally from a constitutional standpoint. I want to make four points about their work. <laughs> First, I want to ask how this book fits with Jeff Powell's own prior work. Um, at a conference we organized in 2003 on um, the public domain. Jeff was a commentator on uh, a prominent uh, uh, scholar of intellectual property in the First Amendment who will remain nameless, Yochai Benkler. And um, <laughs> Professor Benkler presented a description of how the First Amendment and copyright law should intersect, which drew on a variety of norms, uh, freedom enhancing, self-actualization uh, self enhancing, media decentralizing, and so forth. And and uh, Jeff, in the style that I've already described, said, just a lovely talk, and I just have two tiny footnotes for you. And the first footnote was, you just made all this stuff up. Uh, and the second one was, it has nothing to do with the First Amendment. Now, they were much more gracefully expressed than that. And it is possible that Professor Baker never felt the sting, but that's, in fact, what he said. Um, and this is characteristic of Jeff's wider work. Jeff has had the courage. Um, in an academy devoted to fleeing the law for, for almost any other discipline, from neuropsychology to economics to moral philosophy, Jeff has, has taken the radical position that it is actually occasionally possible to do intradisciplinary work and to write about law by writing about law um, uh, and to actually take seriously that position. Um, to take seriously the conversation of the law, not the kind of law talk that I think Neil Siegel rightly criticized, but a centuries-long conversation among lawyers and legal professionals and legal scholars, and to take seriously this as a community of faith, and in my view, this is one of the things that links his work as a legal scholar and a divinity scholar together, that actually empowers human creativity and sustains human culture. The position then is, don't be so quick to run to John Rawls or Amartya Sen for the answer, why not look inside the tradition of the law first? So you might say, well, gosh, this book is marked by many things. Um, provocation, brilliance, beautiful writing. But I think it's fair to say, paraphrasing Monty Python, <coughs> there's not a lot of precedent in it. Uh, in fact, one could say that the title No Law is in fact perfectly descriptive of the book's content. Um, this is not a book which hews to current First Amendment law in its, in my view, impoverished and somewhat cramped treat treatment of the First Amendment. Is this then at odds with Jeff's earlier work? Um, I think that that would be an easy, uh, facile, critical response because I actually think it mistakes what I take to be Jeff's vision of the legal conversation. Jeff's vision of the legal conversation, and I take, take it also of the religious community, is one that does not exclude the work of the iconoclast or the dissident or perhaps even the heretic. It is not a matter, as for those of you who are into hermeneutics, of, of someone like Gadamer who believes that there is an almost entirely closed and finite world which circumscribes what we can say. Instead, it says, start within the community and the tradition of discourse in which you are working. Look to its insights first. They may be exhausted, but this is where we, we must begin. And in that regard, I think that actually, and this is something which is completely, I think, unremarked upon in the book itself, this book is a, a lovely example of Jeff's style of scholarship and, in fact, is in many ways consistent with his desire to do such things as look at the legal opinions of the attorneys general 
as a source of law. This is a place of law talk in the good sense from which we can understand the construction of the law. So too, the roads not taken, the little nuggets unexplored uh, represented here by Justice Black's opinions are perfectly respectable places within the law for us to build anew. So on the first critique, what I initially had seen as surprising, uh, I realized I had been looking in too shallow a way. And I, I think this is actually a nice example of that. And I thought it would be worth pointing it out. My three, I have three more points. And each of them reflect to the way that David and Jeff's proposals would actually be played out in practice. And I take it that we must assume a level playing field here. We can't compare our current law of the First Amendment and copyright, and I agree with Professor Netanel and uh, Professor Siegel and Professors Powell and Lang that it is a crabbed and unsatisfactory and contradictory world. We can't compare that current unsatisfactory world with judges who perhaps misunderstand overprotectionist impulses, uh, beliefs that every time there is value conveyed by a copyrighted work, there must also be the right to control that work. We can't compare that world on the on the one side, our current imperfect world, with the purified, perfect millenarian world conjured up by Lang and Powell, um, administered by judges who resemble strongly Lang and Powell. We have to imagine how their proposal would be played out in our imperfect, psychologically skewed, and sometimes politically captured uh, judicial and political environment. Uh, otherwise, it's not a fair contest. So how would these ideas play out? I have three concerns that I'd just like to mention briefly. Right now, with some uh, exceptions which Professor Reichman will point out at length, uh, in general, copyright offers a binary choice. Either there is control the demand to ask for both permission and fee before use. Or we have areas where the work is free of both permission and fee. If it is a fair use, you need neither pay me nor need ask for my permission. If it is a, a sen affaire, if there is merger, these are all instances in which, sorry, you actually get neither to demand permission or to ask for a fee. For my taste, in that world, the world we currently live in, courts far too often believe that permission is required. Uh, far too often they demand control, and I've written about why that is in other areas. David and Jeff say the First Amendment should bar the permission prong in almost all cases, but not perhaps the demand for fee. Thus, it will be much more open to us to say, take, certainly, yes, but perhaps then pay if value is conveyed. My question is, with this choice available, but with the current psychological tendencies of the bar and bench, what would we get? Would we get a world in which the court now has an intermediary position? Ah, no permission is required, so thus I can feel much happier about demanding fees in many more places. The parodist, for example, well, the parodist is benefiting commercially from the original. So long as he or she need not ask permission, is there any First Amendment objection to the parodist paying the original for uh, whatever commercial value that was added? What about the collage? What about even the scholarly article that criticizes their book to the extent it's very unusual for scholarly articles to make any money. Uh, let's imagine it's a review in a newspaper. After all, they are benefiting from quoting parasitically uh, Lang and Powell's book. Shouldn't a payment stream follow? My question is this. Is it in fact really the case that the injunction is most to be feared in terms of speech? Might the bill, the check, the demand for payment be actually a greater drag on the reality of speech, which I take David and Jeff to be very uh, concerned about, than the sword, the writ. Um, third point, we exist now in a world of massive private copying 
on a scale unimagined by the drafters of the Copyright Act. The word commercial has massively varying meanings across intellectual property law. Sometimes, as in the case of the Lanham Act, commercial just means enough commerce to get you inside the commerce clause. Maybe not Wickard versus Filburn, growing wheat on your own land, but barely any. Sometimes commercial is a serious limit or trigger, as when we talk about, is this a commercial use in fair use? What's interesting to look at is how technologies have changed the meaning of that word commercial. It used to be that commercial meant, particularly in the fair use context, something that was done with the prospect of monetary gain. Why? For many reasons, but one was that it was assumed that only something done for the prospect of monetary gain would exist on a large enough scale to threaten the copyright holder's interests. It was only with the engine of capitalism at your back that you could possibly commit a large enough harm to require us to, to, to think about aiding the, the, the copyright holder. Now, of course, that's not true. Napster was a wonderful example of people all over the world for non-commercial in the sense of not looking for monetary gain reasons, trading files, and yet potentially the scale uh, was the level that the copyright holders perhaps rightly feared. With this world as our backdrop, how might Lang and Powell's proposal allowing demands for fee be interpreted? I note that the old meaning of the term commercial, the idea of actually I was doing it to make money, was transformed over the last 20 or 30 years. And now the courts have said that commercial means getting for free something you otherwise might have had to pay for. Now, to be sure, David and Jeff's book doesn't turn on the meaning of the word commercial. They talk instead about receiving financial benefit, which I think is a separate notion. But imagine this notion, getting for free something you otherwise would have had to pay for. What if courts looking at harm to copyright holders start to interpret the possible demands for fee, and if no fee, then you aren't allowed to use it, and applying it to areas where we actually have private, non-commercial, in that other sense, copying. One of my students in a prior class said that they found this definition of commercial, getting for free something you would otherwise have had to pay for, quite disturbing. I said, yes, what does it mean for Christmas? And the student said, memorably, or dating. <laughs> Fourth, um, that there was one of these lines in, in, in class where you think, I'm not going to follow up on that. <laughs> Moving right along. Um, digital rights management. David and Jeff um, argue that um, the proposals in the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which make it illegal both to circumvent a technical protection measure that surrounds a copyrighted work, a digital fence, both cutting the fence and the prohibition of uh, making technologies that might allow someone to cut those fences, that those are unobjectionable under their, their proposal. I actually disagree for reasons that we would, I'd be happy to get into later. I, I think it all depends on how the actual proposal is classed in what's called Hofeldian analytics, but that I think is a little too much inside baseball for this context. I want to focus on something else. Let's say that they do in fact convince the courts that their vision of the uh, First Amendment is right. No demand for uh, permission can be made, but demand for a fee can be made. However, Congress has and may, the courts can, may continue to enforce, digital controls over copyrighted content and legal uh, protection of those, such that it's actually illegal to cut them. What does the world look like after their proposal? They talk a lot. Uh, although without much evident angst about the way that various industries might suffer economically um, from their proposals. Um, but it seems to me fairly likely that the most obvious response from someone who is seeing large amounts of illicit, in quotes, copying according to their lights, which under the Lang and Powell uh, proposal is now no longer uh, illicit, Copying which they cannot control, let's assume that the courts don't adopt an expanded vision of commercial in this brave new world, so let me assume the, 
the opposite of my, my prior assumption that assumes something I think more congenial to their thesis, what would I do as a copyright holder? It seems to me clear that I would turn to digital protections, legally backed digital protections immediately. In other words, facing a world in which the casebook would be bought by one student and then could be copied freely by every other member of the class, I think that the answer would be that the casebook would be delivered only digitally, and not only would you not be allowed to copy it, you wouldn't even be allowed to read it on your home computer as opposed to your, the, the laptop on which you originally purchased it. We would effectively contract completely outside of copyright into a series of privately walled gardens protected by digital rights management with legally backed contracts of adhesion, effectively negating many of the protections within copyright that are most speech protective. I find this world a less attractive world than our current world. Um, and I think it's something that we would have to be very concerned about. I actually think there are solutions within David and Jeff's proposal that could mitigate that. I, I think there's a revised me reading of the DMCA which might mitigate the problem. But I just think it's something which, in, as they continue to develop this thesis, really de uh, deserves further work. Now to return to the conclusion that I promised you. Um, I offer you a conclusion in the style of David Lang remixed from various fragments of his words and his style, a remix which, according to his own theory, no permission is required and I, and I hope no fee. <laughs> so <clears throat> as I reach the uh, proscenium of the introduction that marks the, the entrance to the opening remarks that precede my preliminary preface, I find that I have gone on at a length which wearies even myself. But I am struck, as I no doubt that you are struck, by the similarity to the themes we have discussed here to the 1953 movie, Shane. <laughs> In Shane, the eponymous hero, played very ably, I may add, by Alan Ladd, <laughs> confronts the cattle baron Riker in a dimly lit saloon of the kind <laughs> normally encountered in such epics. Shane, you will remember, had come to the aid of a group of sharecroppers, small farmers whose livelihood was brutally threatened by the ranchers who wish to drive their cattle across their lands, though it is possible, I must add, that he was not unmoved by the curvaceous charms of one particular farmer's wife. As Shane confronts Riker, we see the passing of a way of life. Shane says to Riker, your time is done. Your kind is finished. And Riker says to Shane, the lone libertarian hero whose Second Amendment rights strang hangs proudly from his hip, is the same not true of you? Yes, replies Shane, but at least I know it. <laughs> Shane, consistent with the thesis that Professor Powell and I put forward in our book, asks Riker what deal he is willing to offer because, after all, libertarians have never been opposed to the deal, to the contract. Riker says there is no deal for the likes of him, and Shane kills him. Um, though, of course, he kills, he kills his hired gun, uh, Wilson, first and does so only in self-defense. Fundamentally, it seems to me that Shane tells us something about our great traditions of American liberty, which is that at some point, the law may or may not give us the freedoms that we require, and that we must turn to direct action, if necessary, in order to secure them. <laughs> now, you might ask, if you are thinking, as I, as I take you to be thinking, <laughs> that it is ironic in the extreme that I take as my hero one Shane who was, in fact, defending the sharecroppers, that is to say those who wished to enclose the open range, the commons of the range, with a series of walled private plots. Is Shane, in fact, not here, the effective equivalent of the Recording Industry Association of America or the Motion of Picture Association of America, a hired gun bully? <laughs> who stands in for those who wish to cut down the great tradition of Americans' liberty and replace it with one of tiny, limited property rights, albeit ones populated by curvaceous farm women. <laughs> <laughs> to this I can only respond. It is true, perhaps, I will admit, that in shooting down Riker, 
Shane is in some sense shooting down the person who could most be said to exemplify the person who insists on the freedom to stroll his cattle where he will, no law will stop him. My response is that of Walt Whitman. Do I contradict myself? Very well then, I contradict myself. I am large and contain multitudes. <laughs> In writing this, um, I have to say, uh, I was aware of just how hard it is to do, even with preparation, what David does spontaneously without any preparation, and I may say, at the drop of a hat. Um, his book, his and Jeff's book, is remarkable for many things. It's remarkable because it actually asks us to take seriously a forgotten fragment of our legal tradition. It's remarkable because it actually asks us to take seriously what the idea of free speech means, even within the realm of copyright. But it's also remarkable for the melding together of two distinctive scholarly styles into something which, in my own view, is a considerably greater work of art even than shade. Thank you. <laughs>
So any scheme to make the First Amendment predominate must carry contractual overrides with it. Uh, and there are some proposed, for example, Dan Burke's digital misuse proposal, I think is very interesting and worthwhile. Uh, Reichman and Franklin have proposed the public interest unconscionability doctrine where, in which you have red, uh, red, green, and yellow baskets of provisions. Red ones you can't use, yellow ones, uh, green ones you can, and yellow ones you have to evaluate. But there must be contractual overrides to safeguard First Amendment cl claims. And then one final quibble before I look at the international side. Uh, I am very gratified, as father of uh, compensatory liability regimes, I'm very gratified at uh, the, the extent to which our authors uh, invoke it uh, uh, as a possible solution. I, I would contend, however, that a compensatory liability regime is a form of property in the sense that it gives proprietors a legally enforceable ex-ante entitlement to compensation under take and pay rules. It imposes a right to borrow or appropriate and a duty to pay an equitable compensation based on the prior creator's contribution. Uh, this is a property right. It's just not an absolute permission right. Now, having said all that, the real question is what to do about international intellectual property uh, treaties. For example, the Bern Convention in its 1971 text, which is incorporated bodily into the TRIPS Agreement of 1994, that is a component of the agreement establishing the World Trade Organization. Uh, then we get the WIPO Copyright Treaty of 1996 and the WIPO Phonograms and Performance Treaty of 1996. Uh, at first glance, uh, <coughs> Lang and Powell's proposals conflict head on with the TRIPS Agreement and the TRIPS Plus provisions which these other treaties impose because they incorporate and exalt the Bern Convention's exclusive rights, and they add to them. And uh, uh, Lang and Powell, in other words, uh, appear to want to abolish the very regime of exclusive rights that the United States and the European Union campaigned so vigorously to impose on developing countries in the last 10 years. Uh, moreover, post-TRIPS law, I international law, has no general purpose exception to exclusive rights comparable even to our fair use safety valve. On the contrary, uh, TRIPS plus the WIPO Copyright Treaty have universally applied a three-step test of uh, exceptions, which is much tougher than fair use and possibly imposes some constraints even on our own fair use. Uh, confined exceptions to exclusive rights, certain special cases do not conflict with normal exploitation of work and do not unreasonably prejudice the legitimate rights of the uh, uh, right holder. Uh, first of all, but l let me just say, however, that closer inspection uh, suggest that the conflict may be less dire than it seems. First of all, the, the TRIPS agreement itself actually introduced some balancing mechanisms into international copyright law that were not previously obligatory under Bairn. For example, <coughs> Article uh, 9.2 of the uh, TRIPS agreement uh, says that copyright protection shall extend to expression and not ideas, procedures, methods of operations, or mathematical concepts. We take that for granted. International public uh, international uh, copyright law did not uh, see it at all. That's a big set of, ex 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 uh, of exclusions. And then Article 10.2 of TRIPS excluded the protection of data or other non-copyrightable matter in compilations. Only the selection, creative selection and arrangement uh, can be protected. So these are in themselves very big balancing factors that have a lot of power in our law. But this does bring us face to face with the uh, famous or infamous Article 13 the pro-publisher three-step test, which pushes against any liberal conception of users' rights, let alone Lang and Powell's right of appropriation under the First Amendment. Now, the experts who first gave us the three-step test in Article 9, I'm not going to put it up there, of the Bern Convention, it's just the reproduction right, the same language, they were marvelously reticent about its meaning. Uh, they produced a single paragraph of explanation embodied in the rapporteur's statement at Stockholm in 1967, uh, a paragraph which was re-examined by the very first uh, interna truly international copyright uh, case in the history of the world uh, by the WTO panel that decided the U.S. Section 110.5 case a few years ago. And this statement, this gloss, largely boils down to a homely proposition. A little unauthorized use is okay, a lot is not okay, and something in between can probably be cured by the payment of equitable compensation. Now, this regarding the well-known cir circularity that uh, it, it just pervades the three-step test, I think you will find that it is more permissive and more flexible than, than you may think, and I'm going to come back to that. Uh, let me start instead with a major, the biggest problem with this formulation. 
It is normatively blind as a bat. It fails to tell us what, if any, user pursuits are particularly worthy from a policy perspective of qualifying for limitations and exceptions. Uh, compare our fair use law instead, section 107, which is normatively clear-sighted. It talks about education, research, science, news reporting, teaching. It identifies whole areas of public interest activities where fair uses might spring up like mushrooms after the rain if only the courts would pay attention. So from here, it is not a huge step to envision free speech as the ultimate normative trump card, which could require a broad freedom to appropriate in the interests of more speech. In this connection, we must note that at the international level, user communities in recent years have begun to push back against the high protectionist trends by specifying normative grounds for rendering the, the, the three-step test less blind. The first success was the preambular declaration that the United States National Academies managed to insert into the uh, WIPO uh, Copyright Treaty of 1996, recognizing the need to maintain a balance between the rights of authors and the larger public interest, particularly education, research, and access to information. Uh, the National Academies also secured the agreed statement to WIPO Copyright uh, 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 Article 10. Article 10 is just the, the three-step test, but the agreed statement says, <laughs> that we will permit contract, it is understood that the provision will permit contracting parties to carry forward and appropriately extend into the digital uh, environment limitations and exceptions in their national laws which have been considered acceptable under the Berne Convention. More importantly, similarly, these provisions should be understood to permit contracting parties to devise new exceptions and limitations that are appropriate in the digital network environment. Now, since that beginning, uh, other important strides have been made. Of particular interest, our new Max Planck proposal, this is the Max Planck Institute for Intellectual Property Law in Munich, which has traditionally been uh, among the highest protectionists, they have now begun to see a different light. Uh, and they have put forward proposals for judges applying the three-step test that could oblige them to perform a normative analysis. Now, performing normative analysis is something that our judges often do at different periods. Uh, they seldom do it in European law. Uh, so this is a big break with their tradition. Uh, the Max Planck proposals deliberately build on the preamble to the WIPO Copyright Treaty. Uh, they would mandate that courts applying the three-step test take into account the interests of third parties, including individual and collective interests of the general public. Uh, they would avoid prior prioritizing any one of the three steps and require that they uh, look at them all the way we do to the four-factor test of fair use. They would give particular weight to unauthorized uses that are underpinned by fundamental rights. And here they have in mind the human rights and human rights convention, uh, especially the human right to free speech uh, and other common interests, notably in scientific progress and cultural or economic development. And they would expressly recognize that adequate compensation may be less than market pricing where other public concerns are at stake. So notice that um, uh, this uh, Max Planck approach could easily and does uh, expressly prioritize First Amendment values. Now, uh, it's true that the Max Planck proposals are legal fantasy in the present circumstances. Uh, but uh, if circumstances change to favor them, and there's a lot of pressure, then a broad recognition of free speech values would become a logical extension uh, of their proposal. Uh, now, uh, while these proposed formulations could do much to reduce the existing blindness of the, the normative blindness of the three-step test, I think U.S. fair use law retains a fatal defect that greatly limits its ability to properly influence the rest of the world. And this is, as we've seen earlier uh, in Jamie's talk, this is the, uh, the provision that uh, fair use cases are normally all or nothing. Either you get it and you get it free or you uh, don't get it and you're under control. As a result, uh, U.S. fair use decisions zigzag between all or nothing outcomes in a relatively incomprehensible task. But uh, unlike uh, Neil, uh, I do attach a lot, a lot of weight to the United States Supreme Court's eBay v. Merck decision. I think it will focus uh, uh, even copyrights court's attention on the possibilities for using a liability rule in place of injunction um, and, and uh, uh, often appropriately in fair use cases. And this is a big point for our authors. <laughs> no injunctions that fail a public interest test may issue. Lang and Powell would say, 
that First Amendment values give us the ultimate definition of the public interest. Hence, no more injunctions that limit the freedom to appropriate expression. And here, indeed, is where the uh, regrettably blind three-step test of international law may have something valuable to teach us. A little unauthorized use may be okay, a lot, wholesale duplication with nothing added may be too much, but something in between may be well worth encouraging if there is a sound normative foundation rooted in the larger public interest and equitable compensation is paid from the proceeds of the unauthorized use. Uh, it does seem to me that we may be moving towards some new synthesis that could combine the normative wisdom of US fair use law with the practical wisdom of those reticent drafters of the gloss on Article 9.2 of the Berne Convention, now Article 13 of TRIPS. If there was a broad consensus that free speech values trumped all normative considerations, then both eBay in the United States and the relevant gloss on the three-step test support a resort to equitable compensation under liability rules and clearinghouses rather than exclusive rights. Now, that does leave still some very thorny problems of derivative works and uh, moral rights, of which I have some ideas, but uh, no time to discuss them now. Let, let me end with the real problem, rather than all these apparent technical problems, and that is the uh, collective action problem. Who will convince uh, domestic legislatures and governments to prioritize First Amendment free speech values over exclusive rights championed by legal monopolists that make big campaign contributions? Not the present administration, you can be sure of that. Clearly, if Lang and Powell seize hold of Congress and some future uh, administration to the point where they legislate in the name of First Amendment guaranteed rights of appropriation, then we could <coughs> envision an enlightened United States trade representative, USTR, supporting the development agenda recently established at the World Intellectual Property Organization. If numerous WIPO members were to support this initiative, uh, it could uh, lead to at least a soft law declaration of normative content that could turn the three-step test into a pathway towards a proper user's rights formulation, and even to recognition from the WIPO process that free speech rights trump all other legal or normative consideration. But this would require USTR to renounce the high protectionist agenda of past and present administrations and to appear teary-eyed as a supplicant before those very developing countries it had dragged kicking and screaming into the TRIPS Agreement of 1994. Do not be surprised if some of these very developing countries turned out to resist USTR's advance in the interest of their own high protectionist interests at home. Thank you. Jerry, I have to say that regardless of the status of no laws as, as, as imaginative or legal fantasy, I think that um, in hearing the words enlightened and U.S. trade representative in the same <laughs> sentence, you have uh, surpassed any, uh, any transformative uh, abilities of David, David and Jeff. Questions? Yeah. So I, I go on for both of you, which is, um, so the damages, I, I take Jamie's point that, um, the requirement of paying damages can be as harmful for First Amendment purposes as the possibility of a court injunction. Um, and a lot of it comes down to what we mean when we say pay damages, right? So as I understood it, at least uh, Jeff and David's book um, calls for the payment of a portion of profits which is earned, um, but nothing beyond that. So if no profits are earned, no payment is necessary. Um, on the other hand, equitable remuneration, as is required in some countries, um, means equitable largely for the copyright holder, holder. So they are the copyright holder is entitled to a stream of revenue regardless of what profits might be earned um, mm -hmm. by the user. Um, so you know, both of you talked about uh, damages and, and mm -hmm. that kind of possible remedy. What, what do you have in mind when you, when you think about that? Well, I think mine is, is relatively short. I mean, my fear is not with David and Jeff's proposal, which as I, I tried to say and probably didn't say clearly enough, you know, isn't um, that, that um, payment is always due but only the proportion of profits. It's that if we have in the world of mass private downloading redefined commercial to mean getting for free anything you might uh, otherwise have to pay for, how might we redefine profit, right? 
And because the same, exactly the same pressures are at work, it's, we're imagining exactly the same judiciary. And as we know, in other cases in the cyber context, very weird and indirect benefits like, oh, it was indirect advertising for your other tied services or you know, have been used in order to say, well, you're actually profiting or this is actually commercial. So the courts have reached to find the equivalent of profit. So my fear was really not so much of their proposal, which I think uh, really does tie it to, no, it's only when I am deliberately using your work in order to add to the value of my own and getting a concrete revenue stream in return, where I think that the danger is much less, I, I think that's a much less problematic. Although I do note that does have implications for commercial parity, for commercial collage, for com other things like that, which currently, right now, no payment would be due. But it's more with that same hydraulic pressure to expand the meaning of profit. I just think that that might be something which in subsequent work they might want to really clarify about why it is very important that we draw the line here and not have any creep. I think Jerry's, Jerry has a different feeling, I think, about the comparative dangers of, of payment. Well, if I can follow up yeah. you, Jerry, which is uh, sort of under current copyright law, yeah, uh, judges can award that, can not issue an injunction, an injunction, but the measure of the damages is set forth in the statute. Um, yeah, well, okay, and that, it's basically well, punitive. Well, look uh, at so your, well, look at the case that you put the the, the use of the, the small cartoon for four minutes in the thing. I mean, um, uh, how much damages are there there? I mean, uh, how much? Uh, it's a non-commercial use. Uh, the damage would be very low if you put if you apply statutory damages. What is it? The minimum two fifty or five hundred dollars, which is about what he should have had to pay if he had to pay anything to begin with. I, I don't see such a big problem. I do want to point out one thing per, per copy. Per copy. Well, of the movie. Well, it depends. <laughs> well, no, they don't. They don't have to do it that way. They don't have to do it that. Yeah, they don't have yeah. to do it that way. It's not. They don't have to do it that. Way. Um, I do. I do want to say one thing before I answer you more fully. I think Jamie is right that there there is always a danger that if you uh, carry the equitable compensation too far, you end up charging for uses that uh, uh, are free. And uh, it's interesting that David, or otherwise free, David's and, and Jeff's book specifically uh, uh, exempts private uses, which is the long tradition. We, we don't have a private use as such in, in our law, but European law traditionally does, and the, the information directive <laughs> changed that and said, <laughs> if you want, yeah, you can have private use, but you have to pay equitable compensation. So that, I think that was, a, that was really a, a, a step backwards. Um, so there is that danger. Um, uh, 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 if you're going to, I mean, if you're going to, if you're going to legislatively uh, implement their proposal, you're going to deal with the damage, uh, the damage provision. I, I have described how a compensatory liability regime could operate in the subpatentable innovation level in the Green, green, green Tulips article, which, which uh, I, I don't know if they have looked at that. There is a remedy there, but I think basically, um, uh, I, I don't think European courts have had much trouble with equitable compensation and. Uh, uh, and that they've handled it, where they've handled it is pretty is pretty simple. If there's if it's a non-commercial use, then maybe there is no equitable compensation. If it's a commercial use, then uh, what do you do? You have to think about what would a reasonable licensee pay uh, uh, under these circumstances. We do it all the time in other areas of law, and we 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 make judgments and uh, compensation come out. I think what I did like about what I thought they took from Green Tulips, but I couldn't be sure because they, they, they cite legal hybrids, is, is that important in the concept is the contribution that the, uh, the relation of the contributions between the first author and the second author. Uh, and I, when people, you ask me about that, I say, well, you can simplify small, medium, and large, okay? If, they, if there's a small amount of uh, the first author's work in what happens, then very little. If there's a lot, then more. And usually it's in between. The other thing about equitable compensation that's very important and is often overlooked, we, we do have these regimes. Uh, FIFRA, the, the Rodenticide and Pesticide Act, has a robust... Uh, liability rule in which these cases are adjudicated all the time. And one of the most important um, uh, aspects of them is that they don't block use of the work. The, the debate about the exact amount of money goes on 
after the, 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 the exploitation occurs. And normally you would expect, as they especially say in the book, you would, ex you would normally expect the parties to bargain around the liability rule and reach their own settlement rather than pay money to have an arbitrator settle it. Uh, the only time you actually end up in adjudication is where they each have a very different view of the importance of their own contribution, in which case you have to resolve it by arbitration, and there's a, there's a whole lot of uh, precedence about doing so. More questions? So, uh, Jamie, this question is uh, for you, and it's, it's like you, you touched on a general problem in constitutional law and theory, which is the distinction between a permissible substitution and an unconstitutional circumvention, right? So I'm imagining how David and Jeff's, if I'm understanding it right, how their approach would apply in the case of our colleagues who spend a lot of time writing and maintaining law school case books, right? So mm -hmm. one person in the class buys it, everyone else copies it. Right? And you say the predictable response would be that the case books going forward will be available only for download. Right? And you can exclude everyone else. Now, are there normative resources available either in their approach or elsewhere in the law to, their, to respond to that response right, under the First Amendment? Would that just be a permissible substitution? Would it be an unconstitutional circumvention? The First Amendment would still apply. And how would we begin to distinguish the two? Uh, by the way, I think it, there's a hilarious subplot working here, which is that poor David and Jeff have to listen to a whole series of other people interpret their work. And by the end of the day, hearing us appropriate their ideas, they may well have changed their views entirely about the, the, uh, the appropriateness of appropriation. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> my own view is that under David and Jeff's proposal, um, I believe that the DMCA, and I think this responds to your point, I think this responds to your point, but tell me if I miss it, that the Digital Millennium Copyright Act actually, that its provisions would fall for the following reason. Um, in other words, it would not be okay for Congress to pass a law which allowed the casebook owner digitally to wrap the book in such a way so as to basically cut off all the rights of fair use, et cetera. Why is that? The way the courts have approached this and the way David and Jeff approach it um, is as a demand by the potential user reader, I have a First Amendment right to fa practical physical access to the best version of the, of the work, right? The equivalent of saying, I need you to get me into Nixon's office and I'm having a hard time opening the door to get his diary out, so give me a crowbar too, and the law requires. And clearly, if that's what the claim is, then it will never, ever, ever succeed, right? I mean, that's just, that's doomed to failure at the moment that it is articulated. I think the claim is a different one. It is this, Congress is forbidden from handing out the exclusive right to prevent access to a work under an intellectual property statute, under the copyright statute, without accompanying that exclusive right, a new right, the right in 1201, not one of the rights in 106, without accompanying that right with the traditional limitations that copyright has uh, required for First Amendment reasons, including Section 107, the fair use provision. So it's not I have a right to a crowbar, it's you don't have a right to hand out this ex large exclusive monopoly unless you accompany it in each case for each class of work with this limitation. So that, I think, kind of gets to your point about permissible and impermissible, although maybe I, maybe I missed it, that in my view, um, in doing that, Congress would go too far. The casebook owner might physically be able to prevent me from uh, exchanging the work, and the First Amendment would not be implicated by that. But if it was the fact that I couldn't get a... Uh, decryption software because people are forbidden from make it and I couldn't, I'm not allowed to make access myself and therefore my fair use and other rights are cut off, then I think that would circumvent um, the First Amendment and would fall, even under David and Jeff's proposal. So I, this is, this is for the second edition, uh, I guess. Meredith. If you're not allowed to make access <clears throat> and you're not allowed access in the parable of Shane mm -hmm. and the cattle that's the only access they have through Shane's farm. Mm -hmm. What would you say the solution is? Um, I, I would say that uh, Shane may not have the right to shoot Riker down, but he does have the right to, uh, uh, the, the, excuse me, that the cattle, the cattle owners may not have the right to, to shoot Shane down, but they do have the right to um, 
uh, uh, purchase wire cutters where the where the where the barbed wire is the barbed wire is 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 effectively enclosing a public thoroughfare and and I take the public thoroughfare in this case to be fair use. But what if the process of cutting completely trashes their livelihood without any benefit to them? It's just access across. Yeah. Well, um, it's a tough call. Um, I actually think that there are some cases where the First Amendment requires us to make free something which might actually completely trash your livelihood. I think, in Neil's wonderful example, Cranston's um, translation of Mein Kampf might destroy the American market for Mein Kampf. Too bad, you know? Uh, um, the parody may lead, the, the parody, The Wind Done Gone, which Jennifer represented the author of, may lead a whole lot of people who loved Gone with the Wind to go, actually, this is a really creepy pro-slavery pro book, and now I feel completely different about it, and that might dramatically depress the sales of Gone with the Wind. You know, too bad. <laughs> I mean, them's, them's the breaks. You know, this is the First Amendment. Um, so I think it can't be the case that the fact that a market would be destroyed automatically means that the First Amendment argument is not there. On the other hand, I take serious Neil's point, which is <laughs> one of the pro-First Amendment aspects of copyright is it produces incentives for people to express themselves and, distri and distribute it. So we can't be oblivious to the commercial effects either. If you destroy the entire market for scholarly monographs, that's not a pro-First Amendment position. So I end up, I'm more agonistic, more torn, I guess, than David and, David and Jeff are. Uh, I would just say that in, 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 in response to your, your point, I, I think one of the advantages of the uh, reverse notice and takedown approach that actually appeals to uh, copyright owners is that if you say, I need this for a specific purpose, uh, then they give you and they are obliged to give you that, free it from the fence and give you the work for that purpose. Uh, they can also say, but use it for that purpose. Okay, so. Uh, if, if it's a, a legitimate use and you stay within the use, then everybody should be okay, but they would also be monitoring it. If, if they've given it you for one use and you make a different use of it, which would require compensation, for example, and you don't pay, then that's something else. So, uh, and, and, and in that event, you need not hack through the fence. You only need, ha need to hack through the fence if they refuse to uh, 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 dislodge it and then uh, uh, a quick declaratory judgment says, okay, well, now you can hack through and get it because they won't give it to you then it's their problem. <laughs> we should probably take one more question before lunch. Um. <coughs> well, two more questions. Here, you and me. I, I was going to say, um, uh, with your uh, twin concerns, the um, uh, if the you know, idea of no law were taken, that uh, the courts might then charge fees to things which are now currently unfeed, and that uh, these contractual restrictions and fences would go up, it seems like there's not much keeping that from happening now, except that people aren't doing it. So is it actually the case that right now pro-fair use people are just, we ought to all just quake in fear that the courts and the companies realize their power and do that anyway while keeping the injunction power? Hmm. That's a great question. Um, my response to it is the content industry is record industry, motion pictures industry believed that they desperately needed these legally backed digital fences or they were, weren't going to put any of their stuff online. And it does seem to me that there actually is an empirical connection between the availability of this legal protection and their willingness to put stuff online. So you, you get iTunes, you know, iTunes emerges much more easily after the Digital Millennium Copyright Act because the initial idea is we can make sure that you can only copy the song eight times. What's really interesting is once that happens, the content companies quickly realize that um, that consumers hate digital rights management with a passion that they will actually pay for unprotected material for the, the MP3 file that has no restrictions on it in preference to the Apple Fairplay AAC file, which you can only copy eight times. They'll even pay a premium, right? Because they look, I want to move this from computer to computer. I bought it. I'm willing to buy it. But for goodness sake, I don't want to get permission each time from Apple. And that actually the rates of illicit copying are no greater among those who are the free MP3 file than those who have the protected one. Partly, I think, that's because right now they have the benefit of the traditional copyright remedies. Copying is not allowed, right, because we have the current rules and not the rules that David and Jeff, um, that David and Jeff uh, uh, describe. Um, and I think as a result, 
the digital rights management has not been nearly as much of a problem in many areas as people thought it would be. It's a huge problem in scientific databases. It's a disaster in scientific databases, right? So and that's there it really is as bad as everybody thought it was going to be, maybe worse. But in the consumer content, I just don't think it has. So I actually think that we're actually managing to wean them away from this kind of you know childish obsession with DRM just because it's clear you can actually make a living without it. And this is almost an idea that well, would it flip them back into embracing DRM more wholeheartedly? But as you know, maybe I'm maybe I'm wrong about that. Keith, you want to take the final shot? Okay. Uh, well, I'm aware of the difficulties of uh, applying analogies from real the real world or real property to intellectual property. But I was going to ask you to speculate a little bit in terms of the question of digital fences on uh, what kind of blowback do you think there might be for our the way we treat uh, property in the real world from some of the insights that uh, that uh, both Lang and Powell and uh, yourself have fought, talked about in terms of. Uh, lessons from digital fence in terms of uh, gated communities, uh, meaning say that, that as, as far as I know, there's no First Amendment right to, in, in, in a sense, have access to a gated community, particularly one with private streets and, and et cetera. But I was going to say, uh, might there be some lessons uh, for, for how we treat gated communities or homeowners associations? Well, of course, company towns, there is, there is the, the, the probably now neglected idea of state action with company towns. You take on all the functions of a a society there that, that perhaps you should be subject to the, the limitations of the First Amendment. Um, and I think that's a, that's a problematic area. I actually think that we have yet to realize how serious this is. I think we've been grappling for it for a hundred years more in the context of real property, things like labor injunctions, things like company towns, things like shopping malls. We fought these battles. What I think we haven't yet got is how this works for our lives. I mean. Can I ask how many people in this room have a Kindle, Amazon's Kindle ebook reader? Right. I would bet that in five years the answer to that question would be, it'll either be the Kindle or be something equivalent, will be 30 or 40 percent. Mm -hmm. 1,500 books that you can hold in your hand. Imagine flying cross country with that. Isn't that pretty nice? Read in full sun, right? 1,500 books. You can download a book while I'm sitting here and download five books, right? Um, but all of those books disappear if Amazon disappears. I can't move them to another device. I'm locked in. I can't lend them to you, Keith, or lend them to Garrett without giving away my entire device. I can't leave them to my kids, right? We have existed in a world where culture, our interaction with culture, presupposed the physical liberties that tangible books gave us. We don't even know how weird it's going to be when it's assumed that, oh, gosh, I wish, what, what company do you read with? Oh, I read with Sony. You know, wow, I wish we read with the same company, you know, so that we could, you know, we could even talk to each other. I think that that's the area where huge First Amendment problems are going to start raising themselves because people are going to say, wow, my assumptions about cultural exchange are just, they've been transformed. Final note, Professor Reichman? No, I, 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 it's interesting that my wife was making this very point the other night. Yeah. And uh, it's, uh, it's uh, I, have I think to say, there's really when, a lot to it. I think when, there's when a Jerry very, is, very big, 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 big problem. When Jerry is using email and PowerPoints That's and right. Trish is talking about eBooks, That's right. the basic assumptions of my world shake. <laughs> <laughs> and with that note, let's have lunch. Thank you.